Hi, today I'm going to talk to you about interpreting and about the kind of interpreting that you'd probably do almost every day. I was a freelance interpreter a long time ago and did the kind of interpreting where you walk into a room and there's a person who speaks English and a person who signs. That's a com those two people are planning to have a conversation and you are the interpreter in the conversation. That kind of interpretive event hasn't been studied very often and we don't often teach that kind of situation in our interpreter training programs. So it became of interest to me to answer not only my own questions about that situation but also to figure out how you might teach that sort of situation to young interpreters. As I began to think about it and read more about it, most of the research that I read about interpreters focused on people who were speaking, who were giving speeches, like I am. Those kinds of events were open to the public and easy to videotape and included a speaker, potentially an interpreter, and an audience that didn't respond to much at all. And so consequently, the only thing to look at was the message of the speaker and the message that the interpreter produced and compare the two. Those comparisons usually pointed out where interpreters made mistakes. That was very helpful in teaching us about the cognitive process of interpreting, but it didn't answer the questions I had when three people are in a room trying to have a conversation. So I wanted to know more and I wanted to know more about that kind of event. So I began to study discourse analysis. And discourse analysis is a methodology that teaches us how to describe conversational behavior. And many, they, after 20 years of studies of conversational behavior in discourse, we know a lot of things about what people are doing when they talk to each other. One of the things people are doing when they talk with each other or have a conversation, they're trying to not only convey information, but often they are showing what kind of attitude they have about the subject, what kind of attitude they have about the meeting. They often show identities of self and ex show how they feel about the subject and what they're talking about, as well as building relationships with the people who are in the room, the people that they're having a conversation with, who they may or may never see again. Um, conversation also depends on the fact that not only do I speak, but I'm listening and then responding to what the other participant says to me. That's the interesting thing about conversation is that much of what we say is not pre-planned, but rather comes about in response to what other people say to us. So conversation becomes cyclical and the meaning builds on what we have said previously and what we will say. So that meaning becomes very flexible and emergent in a conversation, meaning we, things mean more as we talk to each other. Um, discourse analysis also teaches us that um, conversational partners begin to create meaning as they talk at a specific time and place and that that meaning may not carry over into other situations and other places. Um, it also teaches us that we have schemas or background knowledge for going into situations. For example, a doctor's office. We go into a situation, we kind of know what's going to happen in that situation, and then we're also prepared for the situation to change, to not be the same. So those are the kinds of things that discourse, studying discourse tells us about conversation. So then it becomes very interesting to go in and videotape a conversation that includes an interpreter. And one of the things that we want to do in discourse analysis is simply describe what's happening. We don't want to judge it or decide whether the interpreter is doing right or wrong. We simply want to describe what the interpreter is doing. This is a good thing for our field. We haven't often described what successful interpreters are doing. So to describe what they actually do in a very ordinary, typical situation is a good thing to do. <clears throat> I wanted to videotape a situation where two people have come together to talk and there weren't, it wasn't life-threatening. So I ask a good friend who was a deaf student, a graduate student at Georgetown University, if I could videotape a meeting between him and his professor, and he agreed. 
you all probably know the professor who's Dr. Deborah Tannen, a professor of linguistics at Georgetown University and has written a very popular book called That's Not What I Meant, Women and Men in Conversation. The deaf student is Clayton Valley. Clayton Valley is a well-known poet and teacher of American Sign Language in the United States. He recently passed on. Ron Coffey is the interpreter. He's a young man. He had participated in an AA program in interpreter training at Gallaudet University, and he was certified and the child of deaf parents. He too has passed on. In this tape, these three people come together to interpret the meeting that Clayton will have with his professor, Dr. Deborah Tannen. <clears throat> now I'm going to switch to talking to these people in their roles because as we, I studied this videotape, it became important to look at these people in their role. For example, um, Clayton Valley was no longer Clayton Valley the poet, but he was rather Clayton Valley the graduate student. So the roles that they were playing in this situation became the more significant way to label them. So consequently, in this videotape, and when I talk about it, I will refer to the professor, the student, and the interpreter. And you'll see that later in the transcript. So what happened? Well, it was one early fall meeting at Georgetown University where Clay Clayton had come to see Dr. Tannen about his homework. He was taking a class called narrative analysis, and this class was about conversations and how people tell stories in the middle of conversations. All the students were required to record and transcribe a narrative in their own language. So Clayton had transcribed a story in ASL that was told in the middle of a conversation. The professor needed to hear and or see the narrative and approve it, make sure that it was a narrative. And so the student asked for a meeting before class. This meeting lasts about 20 minutes and occurs right before the class is to meet for that week. As they start, the student explains how he's gotten the narrative and explains about transcribing it. He asks the professor to read it. The professor then does read it and then discusses it for a bit with the student. Of course, while they're meeting, other things happen, which does happen to all of us in interpreted meetings. The phone rings, someone knocks on the door, different things like that. I am the one who's filming and I'm standing against the door. So we're going to take a moment and show you this videotape. I want you not to watch it not for what the interpreter does well or wrong or anything like that, but rather watch it as a conversation, how these people talk to each other and how people, one talks and then the other one talks. Colorado. Uh. 
Actually begins when he says, um, "Oh, there was another funny part." But it's good that you included the part before, so you show how it got into it. And I like the fact that you included a line at the end that says, "And that reminds me of another incident." So it's clear that it's going to go on to a different story. So that's good. Uh, the translation is not exactly idiomatic at this point. You're right. Um, Chunking, I have no idea how chunking. Yeah, that's going to be. <laughs> so an that's going to be um, a very interesting. That's going to be a very interesting thing for you to work out, <laughs> and we can talk about it. I mean, it will be interesting for us all to talk about it. What might be what might be comparable cues? You know, we in in spoken language, some of the cues would be intonation and 
rhythmic and also discourse markers. And, but, or, so, anyway. I don't even know if these exist or if there are others. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do exist. Um, it's not by the intonation, but um, there are different ways um, where a person may hesitate or stall. And or um, eye contact, too, is another one. Um, where they pause, there are different ways, and I will try to figure those out. Um, for example, if the person pauses, then I'll try to look for um, something that's equal to that within um, spoken language cues. Yeah, um, it must be. If, I mean, it's going to take a lot of time. Or just thinking about it, maybe, you know, what, what seemed to you natural breaks? If Chafe is correct, and uh, we'll be discussing this in class today. If he's correct that there's a kind of cognitive um, thing going on that's showing up in chunks, in other words, the consciousness of the speaker is focusing on one piece of information at a time. If he's right, then there has to be a corollary in sign. And I would guess that there is. Yeah, but if there too. isn't, if there isn't, that would disprove him. <laughs> Probably there no, is. No, I, I, yeah, I think there is. <laughs> um, I read um, the article talking about chunking, um, and I do understand the concept, so I think that will help me in, in chunking this. Narrative. Okay. Because right here now it's very blocked. Sure. Form, no, it's, that's thing. fine. But do do chunk it in the chunks that seem to be um, that you recognize in the original sign. Don't worry about how the translation looks. this to be ready for next week's class? So well, yeah. could it be possible at all to get it to me by Monday? Monday? Because <laughs> no, I, uh, I get back from Rochester Sunday. No. Um, how about Wednesday morning before class? What I was thinking was having it all ready for everybody by next week. But let me see how many other people don't have them. <laughs> if there's a problem yeah. for a fair number of people, then we'll put it off a week. Okay, um, so I should improve this, or you want this one to put in? With you know what, group I'll, what I'm thinking? What I think we'll do is, if people don't have them, anyone who doesn't have it today, just bring it in next Wednesday in 30 copies. That's what we'll do. Because everybody that has it ready today, I'll get it copied. But anyone who didn't have it today, then bring it in in 30 copies. Okay, I okay. can do that. I'll so bring it with 30 copies. Then we'll have all that'll of them ready to go next week. My pleasure. Uh, oh, don't forget to give me a telephone number where I could reach you by voice. Because what I have on the card is a TTY number. So you want a voice number? Yeah, so if I have to call about something and I don't have a TTY, there's somebody that I could call that could get the message to you. You can call the linguistics department at Gallaudet. Yeah, that's the what's down as a work number. Yes, that's it. But uh, you have that. Yeah, but if it's evening. Um, in the evening. There is one possibility. Cindy. Okay. <laughs> Last time I tried to do that, Cindy wasn't home, but <laughs> I'll try to do things enough in advance so the message gets through. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. <laughs>
so much. And thank you, Cindy. I'm going to use your phone. <laughs> okay. All right. So what I had to do was look at it and think about what was I going to do? What was I going to analyze? And of course, one of the basic features of conversation is turn taking. And it seemed to me a basic problem in interpreted events that speakers are trying to take turns with each other, yet there is an interpreter involved. And so I remembered that often people told me, especially the people who speak English would say to me, often I don't know when it's my turn. And I thought that was an interesting thing for them to say. It was also clear in our interpreting talk our professional talk that we were told to make it seem as if these two people were talking to each other directly but I often felt like these people knew they were not talking to each other directly and they were very conscious of the interpreter in the room so I wanted to see how all that played out and it seemed to me that it played out mostly through turn-taking turn-taking turns are basic structures in conversational behavior and turns can be signaled in a lot of ways. One of them is through the use of language. One of them is through prosody. And prosody is the kind of thing that when I ask a question, my intonation usually rises. Do you want to go? My intonation rose. And people know that's a question. And generally, after a question, it's the other person's turn to answer. But turns also happen because speakers are coming together to talk about things they need to talk about to accomplish a goal. They see themselves as coming together to accomplish an activity, to exchange information, to tell a joke, to make a request, to blame, to complain, and different things like that. And so those sorts of uh, needs motivate their reasons for taking turns. <clears throat> As we turn to the turn taking and turn to the videotape, I analyzed each turn as it occurred and I wrote out a transcript. If you remember now from looking at the videotape, the professor is Dr. Deborah Tannen, a professor of linguistics at Georgetown University. She's well known for writing the book, That's Not What I Meant, Women and Men in Conversation. The student is Clayton Valley. Clayton was teaching at Gallaudet in, at that time. He was also a graduate student at Georgetown, and he was becoming a well-known poet in American Sign Language. The interpreter is Ron Coffey, a young man who was trained at the interpreter training program at Gallaudet University. He was certified and the son of deaf parents. Sadly, both Clayton and Ron have passed on now, and I thank them deeply for their participation in this event. But from now on, I will refer to all three of these people by their role, because that became the important thing in this event, that one person was a professor, that one person was a student, and then one person was an interpreter. And their roles are the identities that they are portraying, for the most part, in this situation. Now I'm going to show you a few things about the turns. And I had to find that turns fell into certain categories. One of the categories was, for example, regular turns. Other turns were turns where overlapping talk occurred, and then there were interpreter turns. I call these regular turns because, for the most part, they work smoothly. No one gets upset, no one's uncomfortable, and the turn happens absolutely satisfactorily. So, when you look at the transcript, you'll see that I've numbered the transcript. I have numbered, uh, st like, stanzas in the transcript. Those numbers are simply the numbers in order as the transcript goes from 1 to 200. They are simply all the things that people say in a row. But within each number, I have a line for the professor, a line for the interpreter, and a line for the student. Generally, the professor comes first, the interpreter's next, and then the student. Everything that's in American Sign Language is in capital letters, and everything that's in English is written in small letters. Often I have little marks in the transcript, 
And sometimes those marks indicate that people, one person stops talking and another person begins. You can see it in the first transcript with the regular turn in English. If you look at line 62, the interpreter has been speaking in line 61. So um, I just want to see if you think this is a narrative. There's a period there to indicate a falling intonation. And then the interpreter speaks one more time or not. And that also is a falling intonation, which is indicated by the period. Then you see a mark that latches the interpreter's talk onto the professor's talk, where the professor says, yeah, okay, great. Part of this is to show that speakers are taking turns with the interpreter and within their own language. They are not taking turns with the other speaker, but rather the turn taking is happening English to English and ASL to ASL. <clears throat> this is important because it demonstrates that not only are these speakers not ever going to talk to each other directly and exchange turns directly, but rather that they're exchanging turns with the interpreter and thus become aware that the interpreter is there. The interpreter is a full human being who is participating in this exchange. So then it becomes sort of ordinary and absolutely natural that any one speaker would turn to the interpreter and ask them a question directly which often happens in interpreting. The next transcript is a regular turn in American Sign Language and I show you this just to show you that it happens in both languages. If you look at line 113 and go to the end of the line you'll see in capital letters have cues that was done in ASL and the student responds almost right away yes. That shows you that in ASL the speaker is responding to the interpreter. So turns are taking place between the deaf speaker and the interpreter and between the hearing speaker and the interpreter. So of course this human being seems to be a fully functioning participant in the turn taking that goes on in this conversation. Regular turns. I call them regular turns because they, because they have no problems, there's no discomfort, the talk flows, the turns go on, and everyone keeps speaking. Um, these regular turns happen frequently throughout this conversation, and we find that they are much like regular turns in discourse because there is no problem with them. However, there are turns with dilemmas. And these turns come about often because speakers will talk at the same time. They're their own person and they do talk when they think it's appropriate to talk. And so often you have speakers who talk along with each other. In the, first tra in the transcripts with overlapping talk, you can see in the first line, number 99, that the professor has said ch chunking and if you look down, the student says, yes. <clears throat> this means that the professor and the student are talking at the same time. But what happens? The interpreter interprets the student. And it turns out, if you look at previous lines, the student has been talking and is sort of answering a question the professor has asked. And so this is the final part of his talk. And the professor probably hears the interpreter slowing down or winding down and says chunking as she starts a new topic. When overlapping talk happens, interpreters have lots of choices. They can stop a speaker. They can interpret one speaker and not interpret the other speaker. They can interpret one speaker, hold the talk of the other speaker, deliver it later. They can ignore speakers. There's just lots of options that interpreters must make a decision very quickly and instantaneously about. If you look further down in the transcript, there's another example of overlapping talk. And this is the example in line 100. If you look at line 100, you can see that the professor says chunking and then laughs. If you look at the student's line, the student fingerspells chunking and laughs. Now it's not possible that these two people understood each other, but this is the kind of interesting thing that does happen in interpreting. They do look at each other. They do eye gaze 
and they laugh together, which is an interesting kind of direct communication that happens and leaves the interpreter out. It's an interesting thing that happens in turn taking. But more importantly, they talk at the same time. And so what does the interpreter choose? This time the interpreter chooses to interpret neither. It's a decision that interpreters make in instantaneously in the fast pace of conversation. The next example of overlapping talk is on line 102. And this is a very interesting situation because three people are talking. The hearing person is talking, the deaf person's talking, and the interpreter's talking too. Obviously, no interpreter cannot d can do this. It's just cognitively not possible to do this. And so interpreters need to make very quick decisions about what to do. And one of the things they can do is stop a speaker. And so in this example, the interpreter uses a time-honored gesture, wait a minute, and stops the student. When the interpreter stops the student, the student is still continuing to talk, but you'll notice after the number seven, there's no talk at all. And then the professor begins again, and the interpreter interprets the professor. This is a fairly interesting thing because the interpreter had to make an instant decision about who to stop. In this particular 20-minute meeting, the interpreter frequently, or most of the time, stopped the deaf student. He didn't stop the professor. Now many of us might say, oh, that's being oppressive, that's taking over control, that's taking the power away from deaf people. But that's not what the deaf person thought at the time, and it's certainly not what the hearing person thought at the time. In fact, one of the reasons I went and interviewed all the participants was to find out what they thought was going on at the time. If they could recall the conversation, what, did they, what were they thinking about, and what did they feel about what was happening? This turned up some very interesting information. First of all, the deaf student told me I want the interpreter to stop me. I only have so many minutes with this professor and I want to know what she's going to tell me. If you look at the transcript example at line 100 where it says same, this is the place where the deaf student commented on having the interpreter stop him. He said, I said same because I wanted to talk about the same thing, chunking, and I was glad she brought it up. I really didn't understand it and I hadn't remembered to ask her about it. I wanted to talk to her about it. There it is in their, his own words that he did not mind being stopped and he said this several times about several of the stops in this interpreted conversation. He was eager for the interpreter to stop him because he didn't want to go on and seem to be talking just for the sake of talking. He wanted to know what the professor had to say. Now let's see what the professor had to say. The professor says, when I'm talking about chunking, I think I clearly feel that what I have to say takes priority and I want to get it out. The interpreter starts talking, but I don't want to hear it. I think I'm not sure whether the student was trying to take a turn or give a back channel, but I'm going to treat it like a back channel because I want to keep talking. I wasn't ready to yield the floor. Now many of you would think this is a very arrogant thing to say, but like many professionals in these situations, the professor has a limited amount of time. She knows that the student came to hear what she had to say. She knows the student, she's the one to talk and to tell the student what things are and what things mean. So in this situation, she was very um, within her rights to keep on speaking and also to keep on speaking because she has a limited amount of time with each student. She doesn't have all the time in the world, which as you know is true of many of these professionals in situations where deaf people come in to find out information, to get information, and to give information. The next kind of turn is called taking a turn. Yes, interpreters take turns and they offer turns. That was one of the most surprising findings in my study. 
we don't think of interpreters as participating in this event. We think of them as just interpreting. But in fact, interpreters can't do that. They also have to coordinate this event. And one of the reasons they have to coordinate the event is because of turn taking. So now we come to an interesting turn where the interpreter offers a turn to the student to get the student to say something else. As we begin to look at this transcript, it's an interesting kind of conversational behavior because it's a kind of negotiation. The student has now asked about turning in the homework. The student has been told to go and correct it and turn it in. And so here's the professor's statement. Well, could it be possible at all to get it to me by Monday? This is a very interesting kind of statement in English. We call it indirectness because the professor has not stated what she wants directly, but rather cloaked it in a lot of hedges, such as, well, and then could it be possible, and then at all. All of these things hedge the strength and force of her statement so that often people hear this not as a request, to turn in the homework by Monday, but as an option whether or not to turn in homework by Monday. And then the interpretation begins in line 175. As you can see, the interpretation goes on for three lines. One of the reasons it does is because of this indirectness in English, and the interpreter is struggling with, how can I say this so that the deaf student truly understands what they're supposed to do? One of the things that deaf people have pointed out to me frequently on this transcript is the fact that the interpreter signs on Monday. This is not the real sign for turning something in on Monday. And consequently, deaf people read it as a very literal in translation, trying to signal to the deaf person how serious it is about turning this transcript in on Monday or turning this homework in on Monday. But as we go down and look at line 178, we notice the deaf student doesn't say yes and doesn't say no. The deaf student says, me come back from Rochester Sunday. Oh my goodness, is that an example of indirectness in ASL? It is. We have this old, old saying about that hearing people talk fuzzy and deaf people talk straight. But here's an example where a deaf person has replied indirectly. They haven't said yes or no directly. So it's a real interesting thing that happens. But it also was not a re the response the professor expected. And you can see that in the next line, where in line 179, the professor says, okay, um, and looks at the floor. The interpreter simultaneously says, um, which is a time-honored device for holding the floor in English. And then the interpreter leans towards the deaf student and does this. That gesture motivates or offers the turn to the student and tells the student they need to say more. And we know that it got interpreted that way because the student, the deaf student, immediately responds with Wednesday morning before class. And so we know that the student understood the meaning of the gesture to keep on talking. And we also know the interpreter understood that the indirect answer didn't work because the interpreter works to hold the floor in line 179 with um. In terms of turn taking, what's happened is the interpreter takes a turn to get the student to take a turn. And so while the interpreter does not tell the deaf student what to say, but simply indicates that the deaf student should say more. This helps the deaf student act appropriately in this American discourse scene that deaf people are not that familiar with. They're not that familiar of, with the rules and processes of how professors and students talk. My evidence for this is the fact that I took this sentence that the professor says at the beginning of this transcript to a lot of graduate student subjects. 
And I asked them, suppose a professor said this sentence to you, what would you say in return? Most of them, almost all of them said they would tell the professor, yes, I'll have it there. But many of, I said to them, suppose you couldn't have it there. Suppose for some reason you were unable to turn it in on Monday morning, how would you answer this question then? And most of these students said to me, then I would say, can I get it to you Monday afternoon? Can I get it to you first thing Tuesday morning? Can I get it to you Tuesday afternoon? And gave me all sorts of possibilities for how they would answer. None of them would have said no to this professor. None of them would have refused or indirectly refused to turn in the homework. They either would have responded yes or they would have offered another time and another place. We can see not only from them that this is a common assumption about how professor-student relationships work, but the interpreter obviously thinks that's how it works too because the interpreter realizes immediately that the deaf student has indirectly told this professor no. <clears throat> and so he works to save face and he works to have the deaf student appear competent in this setting and in this situation. And I think helps the meeting be successful. I think this is the way in which good interpreters work interpreted situations in order for conversation to take place, in order for two people to meet the goal that they came together for, and in order to have everyone's needs met in this conversational setting. Talking is an exchange, and when interpreters are used, they also coordinate this interaction and this exchange between people who are talking. Interpreters have, take turns with these individual participants and thus are seen as full participants. So it's very ordinary and very understandable that the participants see the interpreter as someone who can talk as well because the interpreter is talking and is exchanging turns. So it makes sense that a hearing person might turn to an interpreter and say things like, how did you learn to sign? when the deaf person is doing something else, like having their temperature taken. It also makes sense that as the hearing person answers the phone, a deaf person might have the conversation with the interpreter because we are two people here in a conversational exchange that's possible. So interpreters have shifting responsibilities in their role. They're not just translating. But they're doing more than that. They're managing the process of communication, or as Vadenscho likes to say, they're coordinating the interaction. Cecilia Vadenscho has written about this same sort of process happening in spoken language interpreting between Swedish and Russian, interpreting between Swedish and Russian. She finds that interpreters are doing this coordination of interaction between these two participants who don't speak the same language. And finally, interpreters are not solely responsible for the success or failure of an interpretive event, but all three participants are, have responsibilities in this event. And we can't just look at the interpreter and train the interpreter to just interpret. We have to train interpreters what this is like to coordinate conversation and turn-taking between two people. It becomes a very important part of our professional discussions and of our teaching practice. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I'd like for you to look at the videotape one more time and take a look at the turns and remember what you've seen and heard about. Please feel free to email me at uh, Gallaudet University, I'd be glad to talk to you about it. And you can read a longer discussion in my book, Interpreting as a Discourse Process, published by Oxford University. Thank you. Um, we don't have the uh, videotape here, uh, so that um, you can see the videotape.
Everything is speaking. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Jan. No, as it happens, I have the. Uh, I made another arrangement. But let's do it another time soon. Okay. Good. Bye. I won't answer the phone again. That was automatic. Yeah, have a, it was uh, automatic. Answering machine. That's yeah. great. I do it automatically. <laughs> I'm playing the outgoing message over because. When I answered it, I shut it off, and that interferes with the um, outgoing message. So as soon as it runs through. M-A-R-K-S, K-O-A radio in Denver, Colorado.
Very good. It okay. starts with the, uh, somebody's knocking at the door, by the way. Let's just ignore them. <laughs> Had to say that for myself. <laughs> Um, well, st it, the story actually begins when he says, um, oh, there was another funny part. But it's good that you included the part before so you show how it got into it. And I like the fact that you included a line at the end that says, and that reminds me of another incident. So it's clear that it's going to go on to a different story. So that's good. Uh, the translation is not exactly idiomatic at this point. You're right. Um, yeah, chunking. I, I have no idea how chunking. Yeah, that's going to be. <laughs> so that's going to be um, a very interesting. That's going to be a very interesting thing for you to work out, <laughs> and we can talk about it. I mean, it'll be interesting for us all to talk about it. What might be what might be comparable cues? You know, we, in, in spoken language, some of the cues would be intonation and rhythmic, and also discourse markers. And but. Or so anyway. I don't even know if these exist or if there are others. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do exist. Um, it's not by the intonation, but um, there are different ways um, where a person may hesitate or stall. And or um, eye contact too is another one um, where they pause. There are different ways, and I will try to figure those out. Um, for example, if the person pauses then I'll try to look for um, something that's equal to that within um, spoken language cues. Yeah, um, it must be. If, I mean, it's going to take a lot of time. Or just thinking about it, maybe, you know, what, what seemed to you natural breaks? If Chafe is correct, and uh, we'll be discussing this in class today, if he's correct that there's a kind of cognitive um, thing going on that's showing up in chunks. In other words, the consciousness of the speaker is focusing on one piece of information at a time. If he's right, then there has to be a corollary in sign. And I would guess that there is. Yeah, but if there too. isn't, if there isn't, that would disprove him. <laughs> understand the concept so I think that will help me in, in chunking this narrative okay because good. right here now it's very blocked sure form no, it's, that's thing. fine but do, do chunk it in the chunks that seem to be um, that you recognize in the original sign don't worry about how the translation looks to be ready for next week's class? So well, yeah. could it be possible at all to get it to me by Monday? On Monday? Because <laughs> no, I, uh, I get back from Rochester Sunday. No. Um, how about Wednesday morning before class? What I was thinking was having it all ready for everybody by next week. But let me see how many other people don't have them. If there's a problem yeah. for a fair number of people, then we'll put it off a week. Okay, um, so I should improve this, or you want this one to put in? With you know what no, I'm thinking? What I think we'll do is, if people don't have them, anyone who doesn't have it today, just bring it in next Wednesday in 30 copies. That's what we'll do. Because everybody that has it ready today, I'll get it copied. But anyone who didn't have it today, then bring it in in 30 copies. Okay, okay. I can do that. I'll so bring that'll, it. With that'll, then we'll have all of them ready to go next week. Uh, oh, don't forget to give me a telephone number 
where I could reach you by voice. Because what I have on the card is a TTY number. Do you want a voice number? Yeah, so if I have to call about something, and I don't have a TTY, there's somebody that I could call that could get the message to you. Okay, um, you can call the linguistics department at Gallaudet. Yeah, that's the, what's down as a work number? Yes, that's it. But, uh... Do you have that? Yeah. But if it's evening? Um, in the evening? There is one possibility. All right, well, you can contact Cindy. Okay. <laughs> Last time I tried to do that, Cindy wasn't home, but <laughs> I'll try to do things enough in advance so the message gets to her. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cindy. I'm going to use your phone. <laughs> okay.